first century. Okay. Got it. So, first of all, thank you both for speaking to me. This show is exciting. The music, it just, it stays in your bones and in your soul. And so, obviously, I have to ask, how did the original film kind of help establish not just the building blocks, but you guys also went in depth with the characters and the mood and creating a scene and an atmosphere. Yeah, Brian, you want to start? Uh, sure. You know, I, I really hadn't seen the original film until uh, until I signed on to the project, mm -hmm. and you know, I, I think just like film scores from that era, from that day, for me, are so impactful because you really get to hear the influence of jazz, which at the time was the was the music of the popular culture and the American songbook. Uh, you get to see its influence on on just, you know, the, the rest of the culture, it being in the film the way that we would have, you know, pop songs and, and films today. Um, just those, those scores are so lush and they're so big and they're so grand. Um, so spectacular, you know, I found myself pausing and, and rewinding just to hear, you know, hear a piece again. Uh, and, you know, I, I knew that, you know, something that I wanted to bring to the, the Broadway score is that sort of like lush, grandiose, you know, feeling. That's what I was super excited about when, when we got called for, for the project. The fact that we got to make something kind of like big and, and expansive. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, you know, we're, we're really fortunate, you know, because in, in this day and age in contemporary Broadway, you know, obviously the sort of like big headline that a lot of I, I musicians and people talk about is that like, you know, Broadway pit sizes are shrinking, you know, I mean, in the mid century, in the sort of golden age of musical theater, it was very common to have a, you know, a pit size of 25, 30 plus. And that's partially because technology, you know, as we have it now, didn't exist then. You couldn't have computers that were generating sounds. There wasn't, you know, a keyboard that could emulate the sound of a string section. There weren't electric instruments, you know, as much. And uh, so it was a necessity. If you wanted your show to sound like that and the sound of Broadway of the time, similarly to what Brian said, was this lush orchestral or, you know, symphonic jazz sound. And so it was a necessity to have that as the field of Broadway changed and became more contemporary and started to introduce other genres into it, of course, inevitably, if you have rock or pop music or any other kind of, you know, sort of non-traditional music, you don't need that many people. You only need 10 or less. And that's fine. That's totally fine. But the problem comes with when you do need to emulate this sort of mid-century sound like this show calls for, since it harks back to the movie, a lot of times we run into trouble in our job uh, because the budgets have shrunk and it's very, very tough to get that richness of sound uh, that you need to make it work. And so we're really lucky to have what is now a large pit for the era that we're in, which is of, of 18 people uh, to do. our. And even that is we've really stretched it as far as it can go to emulate that big symphonic uh, mid, you know, MGM film score sound of the time. And, and we've made it work with some trickery. Uh, but we definitely could not have done it with any less musicians than this. That's for sure. So we're very fortunate to have what we have in an era where having 18 people in a pit is relatively uncommon for a new show. Maybe when they're reviving older shows of the era, they say, well, we have to honor the, you know, we have to honor the tradition. That doesn't even happen all the time. A lot of times they revive shows and they say, okay, that's great. But you, you only have 15 people. Sorry. Sorry. Don't know what to tell you. We right. luckily didn't have that problem as much, thankfully, you know, because of the producers and the, the general managers and Mark Shaman, the legendary composer, being able to say, no, we need this. We absolutely need this. Now, I kind of wanted to talk about technology for a little bit. Does, do you find that it hinders or does it kind of help the process of creating, say, new sounds? Mm -hmm. You know, I guess I'll start. Um, it's It can be both. It can be both. Mm -hmm. And the way that it can hinder, I think, is in a situation like this, when you are trying to create an acoustic sound of an orchestra and you rely too heavily on technology, it sounds fake, right? It sounds plasticky. We're not using sounds that are originally generated by electronic instruments, right? We're using acoustic instruments. And in this show, we have to be very careful with the technology to make sure that it is sort of supplementing that in a way that doesn't reveal our hand. You know what I mean? That doesn't, mm -hmm. tip, doesn't show like, the, the meat and potatoes of this has to be live musicians, live musicians first. And then that's the cake and the frosting on top of the cake that really gives it the polish. 
is the added computer generated technology that just helps give it its final shimmer. But the way that we did it, it could absolutely work. If the computers went down, if they crashed, it would still stand on its two feet. It just wouldn't be quite as spectacular, but it would still sound fantastic. So you would just have to make sure in this situation that the 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 computer elements are are like hamburger helper, so to speak. They're just they're filling in the gaps, you know. But they're not they're not the focus. They're not the focus. You know, I, I've worked on pop shows where, you know, the computer goes down, Ableton goes down, and the show has to be canceled. Yep, <laughs> grinds you know, to a halt. Can't continue because it's it's so reliant upon that technology. But it's like Charlie said, you know, we actually refer to a lot of the computer generated sounds and and tracks at sweeteners that's mm-hmm. truly what they are you know it's it's the icing or the sprinkles on top yeah if you have if you have an incredible cake you know and and for some reason the sprinkles don't turn up you can't find the the sprinkles the cake's right. not ruined you're you're gonna be right. okay um and that's really what it is with our show a lot of the sounds that you hear are are being played you know by by charlie a lot of the time or, or you know I'll, I'll add some percussion on top you know it's those little elements where it's like oh it would be also be nice to hear that but unfortunately you know our drummer has his hands and feet full our percussionist has his hands full you know why not throw it into an ableton track you know oh it'd be nice to hear xylo here but this person's already busy it would be nice to just hear that little line it'd be nice to hear harp here you it's know, a little sweeter little... you know the coffee the coffee is still coffee is still good yeah we still the coffee is a good blend it tastes good just a little cream just a little bit you know <laughs> A tiny, a tiny little sugar on top, you know. Yeah, that's that's, that's our right philosophy. That's cool. What I was wondering, you guys, is it's eighteen piece orchestra, and so you're able to create obviously a collective sound. But I'm also able to hear hit a saxophone, the woodbines, the different instruments. So can you talk about not just the collective sound, but that individual and knowing when which instrument stands out? We'll take turns. You can go now. Anyone? <laughs> sure. <laughs> yeah, I. You know, I, I think what's so great about Mark and Scott is that, even within you know, knowing jazz, they're able to really hone in on specific sh- you know subgenres within the jazz the jazz genre. You know, uh, there there are times where we're you know kind of emulating early jazz. You know, and you know that calls for banjo and that calls for clarinet when you know those colors are supposed to be used and then you have like kind of the big band era you know sound which is you know kind of like that big sax section sound with the brass and and you know the gene krupa you know sing 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 toms and you know it it calls back to like you know ellington and basie you have the mgm sound where it's really reliant upon on upon the strings you know uh we're, we're using those uh, orchestral instruments to achieve kind of like that MGM film stage sound mm-hmm. stage sound uh, with with piccolo and and flute. Um, we're really again we were really lucky to have a, a large orchestra, uh, at least for you know modern Broadway. Uh, but beyond that, we're also very lucky to have like an incredibly talented and and versatile group of musicians who are able to double. You know, all of our woodwinds are. You know, at, at any point in the show, you know, you can see them kind of like up there mm-hmm. jumping around, you know, picking up different instruments to play. Um, it, it gives us a really expansive uh, a palette of colors with which to to paint. Um, and we're, we're we're super lucky to to have that. But, you know, I it also is awesome that we have again, we have that freedom to mm-hmm. to, to kind of decide, you know, to, to look at where we, it's the dramaturgy of it all, to kind of like look at the show and where we are. And it's like, oh, it'd be nice to differentiate this song from this song by like making this one, you know, more reminiscent of something that we might hear in, you know, New Orleans jazz versus this is something, you know, they're they're in a club right now, you know, they're they're drinking in a club. So maybe this would be a little bit more, a little bit more dirty. It's a little bit, <laughs> it's one of those. Finger poppers as my grandfather used to call them. Yeah. So I was also was interesting. I wanted to know the process of because we see the final product. So I'm really interested in the process of what it is that moves you. Is it when you're breaking down a scene? Is it the emotion 
Or is it what that character is doing in that moment that really drives and underscores the music? Yeah, that's and that's a really great question because it's sort of a continuation on the question before because what you're asking now is, uh, Brian's answer was was telling you how us the choices and the instruments can set the genre and the time frame and the feeling. But what you're referring to now is is the function in a theatrical sense of the mm -hmm. music, right? There's standalone music. You go see a big band, whoever wrote that piece of music, they do what they do. It stands alone. You watch the music. Theater is it's a unique beast because you know, a lot of people say, what's your favorite genre of music? And people will say, oh, it's Broadway, it's it's show tunes. When in fact, that in and of itself is not a genre, it's a delivery vehicle with which shows take other genres and they repurpose that music dramatically for storytelling. So now what you're referring to is the function of the genre of music within the context of telling the story of these characters, right? Mm -hmm. So on top of all of the reasons that Brian gave uh, for orchestrational choices, is, and this is really getting into what it is to orchestrate, the art of orchestrating is, mm -hmm. The theater orchestrator, and you know, that's a that's a it's a kind of old-fashioned term that we sort of only use in theater and film, but basically what it is is an orchestrator or an arranger or producer, or whatever. They hear a song, they hear a piece of music, they and they understand the unrealized potential in that music and what it needs to do in order to like add depth and color and grandness and scale and emotion and whatever. But in the theater, what we do is we watch the context of that music, like you're saying, and you see the actors playing out their scene. You look at the lyrics, what are they feeling in that moment? They they give they they give a glance to each other even without saying anything that has a feeling. What's their inner world like? And so that informs you to say, okay, well, they're feeling this way, and I think the mirror of that emotion must be the flute. It must be it must be the romance of the strings. It must be solo guitar because it's simple, or it's it's must be this big orchestral sweeping section that that moves you, you know or it's sensitive and it's, or it's angry. So more brass, you know? And so really looking at the, and each character in in themselves will also have a palette of sounds that dictates how they move about the world of the show. Right. And so uh, it, it is this specifically theater sense and somewhat of a film scoring thing to look at the on stage action and emotion and journey of the characters and choose the best way to underscore that with the sonic palette you have available uh, and again, because we have such a large palette here, we do have such a wide variety of colors. And as you said before, we because we have that large number, we can play with sections. You know, this character is a sax section thing. But while the sax section is doing that, maybe somebody else comes on stage and we have enough people to use the brass to comment on their action. So we can have multiple things going on at the same time, which is a luxury that sadly not all shows, you know, give you. Okay. And so I was wondering, you guys have been a part of musical theater and have done plays, the music aspect of it for so long. So how has it for both of you kind of influenced your own sound? Mm. I'd be interested for to hear from you, Brian, because you're somewhat of a more of a newcomer to the genre than I am, actually. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I, I primarily uh, function as a, you know, a jazz musician, more or less. You know, this is my second show, you know, that I've, that I've worked on. This is my first kind of like full, uh, my first show you know, going all the way, you know, from the beginning to the end in terms mm -hmm. of like the full process. Um, wow, how has it affected my sound? You know, I, I think it's definitely made me more aware of... <laughs> you okay? You all right? <laughs> <laughs> oh, <boy. laughs> I hope that wasn't, you know, okay. a very valuable piece of artwork. Nope, nope, it was all right. <laughs> um, <laughs> what's I saying? Oh, it certainly made me more aware of, of the lyric. You know, uh, just we as orchestrators, you know, we have to be so careful with dialogue, you know, on stage, making sure that we're always complimenting and never covering up or never, you know, mm -hmm. being distracting in an, in an unintentional way. And as I find myself, you know, writing now and for the concert setting or even for, you know, recordings, I'm like, I'm always, I feel like I'm more aware now of, of what's going on in the lyric and, and what the meaning and the truth and, again, the dramaturgy behind the song is. Um, you know, I feel like it's a, it's a mark of maturity. I feel like I'm, I'm writing more like a grown-up now. I'm like, you know what? This would be fun to write and it'd be, everyone would be like, wow. Brian's a great writer. Is it service? It's, 
is it serving a purpose for for putting that on the page yeah that's honestly i was going to give the exact same answer i mean the the thing that i think continuing with that that theater has taught me the most is that every single choice that you make as a musician or as a play, even a player in the pit or but a, a writer a composer an orchestrator it has to have a justification a dramaturgical justification that serves the show serves the lyric serves the character uh, you know as opposed to when you're doing a standalone piece of music where you can be the focus and you can do whatever you want doesn't matter go for it doesn't matter in the context of theater pay really close attention to the writing and let your let your cho musical choices be informed by that all the time so what has music kind of given to both of you personally hmm. i mean it's well. given us i think both of us the opportunity to meet some truly incredible artists and performers and work with them see the world you know travel a lot on somebody else's dime which you know is great <laughs> i'm in london right now for that very reason that's cool um and just be exposed to a, a ton of different uh music and as a result i think a ton of different cultures and different you know uh feet in different groups of people different scenes different experiences people with different backgrounds that you know you can you can share music with uh, that's that's sort of the global answer for me okay. yeah a, a, definitely a platform to share our experience to share our own understanding of our experience and the way that we see the world as artists the way that i personally see the man as a, a black man as a queer man um mm -hmm. you know i think back to you know last summer and the summer before we talk about not only in in the arts world in terms of you know black people letting everyone know how you know our experience has been <laughs> in these industries yeah. but you know as a, as a black man in america you know i i would not have had the platform that i that i have had i not been a musician you know specifically so jazz we're right i'm sorry oh no no i'm sorry you know, we're we're writing a we're writing a show about the uh, the jazz age, and first and foremost, you know, this music has always been you know a music of protest and a music of healing. And very early on in the show, you know, one of the characters, Sweet Sue, you know, uh, her bandmate asks asks her a question. She says, you know, are we heading south? Where are we going on tour? And she goes, I'm a black woman in the 1930s. What do you think? Hmm. You know, that's what this that's what this music has always been. And we look at the characters that that these people are modeled after these black female band leaders, people like Billy Holiday and Bessie Smith, they were truly putting their lives on the line to travel around the country in a segregated America in a time where, you know, black female musicians, black females in general had no no voice. Um, you know that's that's what this music has given me it's given it's given me a platform and a way and an outlet to express my voice so i know that you were the part of the passing of a strange loop and so how has that kind of impacted you as well brian you want to take that one again i have, yeah. thought, I have thoughts but you go first sure uh you know it's the first time I'd, I'd ever seen uh, such a clear and honest, <laughs> a clear and, and honest, you know, I, I don't want to say, you know, it's not a, it's not a biography, uh, portrait of, mm -hmm. you know, again, of an artist of, of, you know, Michael's experience. And it's done in such a thoughtful and, and genius way, you know, where you're, you're kind of getting a play within a play within a play. <laughs> uh, me personally, you know, I, the first few times I, I saw it, it was not staged. It was, you know, in a reading, uh, and I was very focused on what was happening musically. And it wasn't until we we got down to Wooly Mammoth uh, in D.C., you know, where I kind of like left the band room it was during COVID times. So the band was kind of isolated in its own room, and you know, I'm, again looking at scores and looking at. Ableton and, and, and patch changes and I'm trying to make sure everything's working musically. It wasn't really until, you know, the first time I kind of went upstairs and left my score downstairs and just like watched the show that I got the full impact. And it was extremely impactful 
you know, to me because it was, it was so honest, you know, honestly, it, it made me kind of like face, <laughs> face some own things in my life that I was like, oh, wow, uh, I should, I should address that. You know, my parents came and they saw it and it opened a door for, you know, a two and a half hour, two and a half hour conversation with my own parents. Uh, yeah. That's what great art is supposed to do. Yeah. You know, you know what I love? Michael said something once to me and to other people that I found really poignant about the show. He said that, you know, for some, for some people, there's a lot of access points for strange that strange loop has for a great many people. And for some people it's a window and some people it's a mirror. Uh, mm -hmm. And I think what I love most about that show is that it's, I cannot remember truly ever if I have seen a show that has just been like unabashedly, like, here's my experience, here it is. It's so specific, but because it's so specific and it's so honest, it's it's universal. You know, if you have any any amount of empathy whatsoever, you, you anybody, you see Strange Loop in the relationship and Usher's finding himself, his place in the world, his parents coming to terms with his past, his queerness, his struggle is so honest and so real that, you know, I, anybody can be able to relate to that. And I think the coolest thing about it is that because it's so honest, and for me, obviously, it's a window, not a mirror. It has, I've, you know, a lot of my other Black friends who have seen Strange Loop, like it really has opened up a lot of conversations for me to be like, what was, you know, how much of that did you feel like you experienced? How much didn't you? How much do you currently experience? Like, what's that, you know, what was that like for you? You know, what's what was the experience of seeing the show? Just like, tell me about that. And it's been really, it's been really insightful, you know? It, it's a, just, God, I love that show. God, I love it. It's so good. It is a great show. And so I was, what's interesting is that with music, everything is always changing. And now with the plays and musicals in that kind of space, that's changing as well in terms of there are more voices that are being heard. How does that impact the flow of the music or does it not at all? I feel like it does because one one big sort of gripe I've had with uh, theater music as a whole in the last like maybe 15 years that I lived in New York is because of a result of what I sort of said earlier, wherein, you know, Broadway musicals derive other genres, right? And they use those genres for their own function, which means that they're inherently they're derivative, right? So you're a step away from the real thing already, right? right. You run the risk of then whatever the genre of music you're emulating is not doing it authentically, right? Because you have people that are making that music that don't actually, they're already removed. And if they grew up only listening to show tunes, for example, then, you know, they're, all, they're like three levels away from the source, you know? And so I think that hopefully we're coming to a time now where when we, when people want to write shows that use specific genres that come from any culture that is a specific, you know, lineage, they employ the correct people to make sure that the music is being represented authentically. Hopefully. Right. No, really what, what Charlie said, you know, I, I think if you had asked me, you know, 10 years ago, it's, it's funny. Uh, it's not funny. It's horrific. We, we lost Bert <laughs> Bacharach yesterday and Charlie and I met on a, uh, on the a workshop of a show that was, uh, Kind of like a, re a review a musical review of Burt Bacharach's music True. I was gonna I meant to text you when I read that yeah you know and, and also Laura Dreyfus and and Cal Riapko and you know recent Oscar. Oscar and Grammy and every other award winner Ariana DeBose uh was also a part of that show and I think if you had spoken to me then about if I wanted to work in theater the answer would have been absolutely not because it it did come off so corny and, you know, not authentic to me, uh, especially someone who grew up in a household where like all different types of music, more specifically black American music was represented and kind of the idea and my own methodology and the way that I was always taught is we approach this with the maximum amount of realness and verite, verite and authenticity. And it's like, we have to go to the source to make sure that we are speaking this language with a very specific type of fluidity. And that was always missing in the theater to me. <laughs> and mm -hmm. as we include more voices, you know, uh, 
into theater as as we get more perspectives i think that it is getting you know more and more authentic more and more real you know a, a lot of my friends who work in jazz or outside of theater who come and they see something like it hot they're like and the band, yeah the band is swinging <laughs> like it's not like you know it's not <laughs> that kind of, what we know is kind of like jazz broadway jazz you know or like they're like, wow, this this band is, is really swinging. They're playing the real thing. They're dealing with the real music, which is refreshing. So you you both have been working with each other both on stage and off stage for a little while now. And so I wanted to know how is basically both of your musical experience impacted or influenced each other? Yeah, I love I love answering this question because I I mean I can't we've known each other for over a decade, which is still I it feels weird to say that. <laughs> it's so crazy. <laughs> That's so crazy. But I like I have over the years, I mean, drawn so much vocabulary, musical vocabulary from Brian, uh, both as a as a player, his playing and also his writing and his incredibly in-depth knowledge of the pedagogy of jazz and, and the eras of jazz. I, I mean, I there's I there's there's even like I'm I'm here on, in London working on a production of Guys and Dolls that I'm orchestrating and Brian wrote this like great horn line and some like it hot that I really love. And I've, I've uh, uh, respectfully lifted it to put in the guys and dolls. So now it's part of the theater pedagogy, you know, now it's in there. That's, it's really great. Yeah. Sorry. I know. Sorry. And not to steal your lines, but they are very killing, <laughs> but it's, it's you know, so yeah, but overall it's, there's just been such an amazing back and forth of, of musical language between us, I think. Yeah, there's there's a type of ease and and I always use the word trust. Like I really really trust Charlie, and when you're able to get to you know that type of relationship between musicians in general, it just it opens everything up. You know there there are no barriers. You know I I trust when I'm in the theater and I, I'm unfamiliar with things. I trust if he's like no this doesn't work or this you know I don't feel the need to to push to push anything because I know there's there's no there's no agenda there. It's just about getting again to kind of like the, the the realist, most authentic thing. And we both want the same thing, which is a great a great orchestration yeah. <laughs> for the show. And also Charlie's a genius, you know. Oh, you're a genius. No, <laughs> he's one of the he's one of the true the true geniuses uh on, on Broadway right now. And it's really, really inspiring to watch him work. That's and nice. To like, you know, see him, see him in his element. So. so, what do you want for both of you? What do you want your legacy to be? Wow. In music. <laughs> you can go first because I need to look at we Are we old enough to start getting this question? Well, well, I, have you even thought about it? Because you know, you, you, your music is lasting. No, you're no right. No matter what. You're right. Even you're if right. a show may close, you know, the next day, it's still there. We have the music. You're right. Well, you know, I actually there have been a couple of things that I have kind of felt that way about. Uh, one of them actually is the show I'm doing now. I'm doing this reorchestration of Guys and Dolls, which is an interesting show because for whatever reason, every time Guys and Dolls gets revived, it gets completely reorchestrated. Uh, mm -hmm. It's one of the few sort of golden age shows that where they do they do it differently every time. But so doing it now on the West End here does feel sort of like, OK, there's my mark. I've done my Guys and Dolls. I'm I'm now a part of the the orchestration theater you know, collective of the ages dating back to the forties that have orchestrated guys and dolls. I've got my name on one. People know that like there'll be an album of it and there it is. Um, you know, the other thing I do is I have this uh, video game music jazz orchestra that uh, mm -hmm. called the 8-Bit Big Band. And uh, we won a Grammy for an arrangement of, of a song, a song from uh, super, a Super Nintendo game from Kirby Superstar from like 30 years ago, you know? So that feels like uh, well, you know, that's only the second time any piece of video game music had ever won a Grammy. Now this year, there's an entire category dedicated to it. As a result, maybe I don't think I don't want to say I want to say my winning was maybe part of that discussion. That feels yeah. like a big, right? Yeah, that feels like a I'll big say thing. it. Yeah, say it. Charlie yeah. made that. <laughs> <laughs> that feels like a cool. legacy and sort of like establishing a new, you know, uh, canon and songbook of of songs that the video game music scene is now like getting a lot of exposure. And it's it's cool to be a part of that. That feels like a piece of legacy, I'll say. Very nice. Yeah, when I when I look at someone like Quincy Jones, you know, I think about like his vast musical reach. Like he has such a wide span. 
mm-hmm. of, of music. If you look at every decade, like you look at the 60s and his work with Sinatra or, you know, the music that he was making in the 70s that end up in film scores, the late 90s, you know, if you like Austin Powers, if you look at <laughs> his work in the 80s with Thriller, you know, going back to the 70s, The Wiz, which was, I watched yeah. The Wiz every, you know, uh, you know, he has such a wide musical breadth. I think that's the type of legacy that that I want to leave. I want people to be like, oh, remember those jazz recordings that Brian made 20 years ago? Oh, yeah, have you ever heard his his Broadway orchestrations? Have you heard those scores? Those are amazing. Have you heard his film stuff? Have you, you know, that's the type of, of legacy that I'd, that I'd like to leave. You know, I, I think of someone like uh, Terrence Blanchard today. Mm-hmm. Terrence has jazz recordings. Terrence has worked with pop musicians. Terrence Operas. An opera <laughs> for, for the Metropolitan Opera. He's the first black composer ever to to write an opera, for, to, to be commissioned for an opera by the Met. And it was so incredibly well received. It just won a Grammy, you know. Last a Grammy, week. Yeah. I was going to say, yeah. You know, uh, he has a, a wide musical breadth and, and, and reach. So Wonderful. I'd love for that to be my legacy as well. I like that. Both, both very powerful. And thank you guys both for speaking with me. I learned so much about music and what goes on behind the scenes and put, when you put together, you know, a score. So thank you for sharing your insight and your genius, really. Absolutely. Thanks for having us. No problem. <laughs> thank you so much. Cool. Talk to you later. Talk to you later. Have a good one.